Welcome to Stories de la Frontera. I'm Laura Castaneda. The brutal murder of a little girl in Tijuana more than 65 years ago marks the beginning of a modern border tale. It's a story of faith, mystery, and controversy. The man accused of the killing, a Mexican serviceman called Juan Soldado or Juan the Soldier, was found guilty of the crime. His sentence, death by execution. Today, strangely enough, thousands of people on both sides of the border flocked to his gravesite to worship him. It was 1938, and Tijuana was a typical border community of 19,000. The quiet town was quickly flourishing into a thriving community of commerce by day and a risky nightlife after sunset. But on February 13, 1938, things changed. The residents of Tijuana were shocked when eight-year-old Olga Camacho of the well-respected Camacho family was raped and murdered. In life, Olga had been a pretty green-eyed girl who was as comfortable playing with her dolls as she was listening to a sermon in church. What's more, her family lived in the heart of the city, which happened to be where the army fort was located. People felt secure, so much so that on the afternoon of February 13th, Olga's family sent the little girl to the store to pick up meat for dinner. She never came back. The search for Olga started almost immediately after her disappearance. Everybody got involved. The family, the police, and the community. Eventually, Olga's body was found next to a small garage. Her throat had been slashed. Her body showed signs of sexual abuse before and after she was killed. Although Olga's sister, Concepcion Camacho, had not yet been born, she remembers hearing stories. Nunca preguntábamos nosotros, sabíamos que una hermanita había muerto conforme íbamos creciendo. Pues nunca preguntábamos porque sabíamos que había sido una tragedia. Nunca, detalles, nunca. Fuimos sabiendo por las primitas, por los tíos. Authorities immediately arrested five suspects, including Army Private Juan Castillo Morales, a 24-year-old soldier from the southern state of Oaxaca. The same day he was arrested, his own wife turned in incriminating evidence against him, his blood-soaked uniform. Local investigators, along with FBI forensic experts from San Diego, gathered even more evidence against Castillo Morales. Unexplained scratches on his neck, his footprints at the scene of the crime, and fibers from the sweater he was wearing under the dead girl's nails. And there was this. His fingerprints were all over the package of meat Olga had picked up from the store. Castillo Morales knew he was trapped, and he finally confessed. The townspeople were enraged and riots broke out. Police headquarters and city hall went up in flames. Several people were injured during the melee. The army tried Castillo Morales. After finding him guilty, it applied what it considered a just and quick sentence the runaway law, or la ley fuga, a law which allowed condemned men like Castillo Morales to flee before a firing squad, only to be shot in the back while attempting to escape. The execution was open to the public. Over the years, the image of Castillo Morales changed. Through a quirk of fate, the convicted killer is now considered by thousands as a patron saint of undocumented immigrants and protector of the poor. Hace dos años, mi hijo me habían dicho que estaba muy grave el corazón y fui de doctor en doctor hasta que alguien me dijo que que si creía en Juan Soldado, yo no no lo había oído de él y este y me trajeron y vine y le pedí y cuando fui de vuelta con los doctores a hacerle estudios a mi hijo ya estaba bien. No, resultó que no era grave el corazón como me habían dicho, que era una alergia. Y se le quitó. Y creí de, desde ahí vengo. The transformation of Castillo Morales, now referred to lovingly as Juan Soldado or Juan the Soldier, may have to do with the version of those who believe in his innocence. Many are convinced that he was framed after his general raped and killed Olga. Others say Castillo Morales was nothing but a cold hearted killer and find it offensive to see his tomb treated like a shrine. Mi familia tiene mucha fe en él. A mi hermano le concedió un milagro. 
que le pidió de todo corazón. Y no pierdo las esperanzas de que el día de mañana me, me lo conceda a mí también. Segura estamos que Juan Soldado que tuvo que ver, ¿verdad? Estuvo involucrado directamente y que es culpable. Y no aceptamos y nunca lo vamos a aceptar que lo esté venerando, jamás. Que le recen a cualquier otro santo. Pero ese no es santo. But year after year, new and old followers keep coming. Many of Juan Soldado's believers are Catholics, yet the Catholic Church has never considered him a saint. Father Antonio Plasencia says the church tolerates the worshiping, but does not condone it. ¿Verdad? A veces este, suele suceder mucho eso en la historia cuando alguien comete un mal, tratar por otro lado de resaltarle virtudes para ocultar aquel mal, ¿no? Y pues a veces la justicia no es muy clara por ahí. Only one thing seems clear. Whether Juan Soldado was evil or not, thousands of followers from Mexico and the United States believe. Juan Castillo Morales and Olga Camacho were buried a short distance from each other in the same Tijuana cemetery. When the devotion to Juan Soldado began, Olga's father had his daughter's body exhumed and taken to another nearby cemetery. Well, border security is on the minds of many people these days as the U.S. State Department issues an alert to all U.S. citizens traveling to five cities in Mexico. Tijuana, just across the border from San Diego, is one of them. Authorities in Baja, though, consider the alert misleading. Carmen Escobosa explains. Tijuana woke up to the new year with bloodshed, violence, and kidnappings. By the end of the first three months, the number of killings had surpassed 100. The U.S. State Department issued an alert not only in Baja California, but in four other Mexican border cities, saying it is concerned for the well-being of its citizens traveling to or residing in Baja California. That's what we are. The governor of Baja California rejected the State Department alert. It's an attitude imperialist. An attitude, digamos, de poco respeto. Hay más violencia en San Diego, en Los Angeles y en Phoenix por persona que en Baja California. The U.S. consulate in Tijuana admits the dangers faced by U.S. citizens in Tijuana differ from the ones faced in other border cities. But in each area, obviously, there's a different situation. In Nuevo Laredo, for example, on the Texas border with Mexico, they have seen a rather alarming number of kidnappings that they feel are directed at American citizens. We have not seen that here in Tijuana at all. We have not seen American citizens being targeted specifically as Americans in any way. But what we have seen is a lot of crime here, the kind of situation where someone could be at the wrong place at the wrong time, could get caught up in something. Francisco Castro Trenti, head of the Homicide Unit and the Forensic Department in Baja California, explains there are very few incidents in which U.S. citizens die in Tijuana. Cuando llega a suceder, básicamente se debe a alguna situación de tránsito, a algún accidente entre tráfico de vehículos, entre, entre dos o más. O... Governor Elordi goes beyond that. No ha habido un solo incidente de violencia con un norteamericano en Baja California en los últimos cinco o seis años. Porque estamos egresados. Nevertheless, authorities in Baja know perfectly well they need to do better in the fight against crime, not only for the sake of their visitors, but for the sake of their local residents, their business community, their foreign investors, and even their local press, which has been deeply hurt. Exigimos justicia. So, in order to accomplish their goal, authorities in Baja have taken steps that might surprise more than one. Out of this building in Tijuana, help is being dispatched to assist all types of emergencies. Es decir, una persona que tiene una emergencia de cualquier teléfono celular público o teléfono este, comercial, marca 066 y es ya, les llamada gratuita. Personnel with different law enforcement agencies are available 24-7. Hay dos datos que nosotros ocupamos para tener a la persona. Primero es dónde están pasando las cosas y qué está pasando. Dispatchers at this operation center are bilingual. Si un turista tiene una emergencia aquí en la ciudad, ya sea nacional o extranjero, lo atendemos. La llamada es transferida al 078 para que ellos le den seguimiento, a lo mejor ponerlo en contacto con su consulado, contactar a sus familiares, ayudarlo de alguna forma a llegar a la línea. But there's more. 
On the other side of the building, city police officers monitor the video signals fed by 15 cameras installed along the main streets of Tijuana. Supervisor Angelica Mesquita shows the effectiveness of the cameras when there's a need to get the license plates, when trying to scrutinize entrances at bars and restaurants, or any other irregular activity. The 15 cameras will soon turn into 250. Did you know you are being watched by cameras like that one? Yeah, I heard about that a long time ago, yeah. And what do you feel about it? I don't even know if it works. <laughs> It makes me feel safer. Like, say, if it's like in my bag, somebody like ran off with my bag, then they would know the person that did it. But while this surveillance is going on in the streets of Tijuana, a city and a state police helicopter fly over the riskiest areas. When they see anything wrong, they touch base, make an emergency landing, and assist their colleagues on site. Actions like this one are now part of their ongoing training. Seven trained dogs assist the officers in the search of drugs, explosives, and weapons. There are also attack dogs, which are very helpful in scenarios like this one. Antonio Rocha, a state police commander, will be a member of the first generation nationwide to get a degree on law enforcement. Salir ya, ya del esquema del, del, de tradicional de que no estudiaste, hazte policía. ¿no? La cuestión de la corrupción se ve de manera distinta una vez que uno va adquiriendo más y mejor educación. Sí, claro. Major steps have also been taken in other areas. Personnel at the state general attorney's office are constantly being monitored throughout the state. Even the jail cells, where in some cases Americans are held, are being watched. In terms of forensic science, they claim to be in a more advanced standing now. This vehicle is one of their most recent acquisitions. Nos permite este, trasladar el laboratorio móvil a la propia escena del crimen y analizar los indicios o las evidencias que localizamos. Despite of all these changes, corruption still plays an important factor in the fight against crime. We've had some, for example, some cases of reports where Americans were solicited for a bribe by a policeman here in Tijuana. The authorities here have been very cooperative in following up, identifying the officers and making changes. And in cases where the victim doesn't want to go back to Tijuana, the police report can be filed either by phone or in person in any of the police stations in San Diego. Sigue habiendo los granitos negros del arroz. No podemos permitir que por una gente, una mala acción de una gente se manche el nombre de una, de una corporación. One thing is clear. Tourism is one of the most important sources of revenues for Baja California. And it seems the state is beefing up security on all levels in order to provide tourists and local residents with a safer environment, knowing it is in their best interest. Tourism generated $900 million in revenue for Baja in 2003. Officials expect those numbers to rise even higher in the future. Back on this side of the border, another business is raking in big dollars and big interest, lowriders. Earlier this year, 13-year-old Frankie Aguayo found out what drives the passion of these old-school, die-hard California lowriders. Here's a clip from his documentary. My name is Victor Cordero. I've been doing what I do um, for 13 years. I, uh, I started by painting, painting cars, um, and I got a little bit more into the custom paint job, doing graphic work, airbrush, striping, and I liked that better, so I pretty much left painting. About 13 years ago when I started, I started on my own car, working on my own car, and, and from there people saw it, liked what they saw, and 
took off. <laughs> my first car, I was in 11th grade. I was in 81, 1981, by my first car. And ever since then, I've had a lowrider. It's a 37 Chevy. With me now is Frankie Aguayo, the 13-year-old director of Low Riding Life. Now, Frankie, you did this project through the Media Arts Center's Teen Producers Project, right? Tell me what you learned through all this. I learned that if it's your first time ever making a video, that is hard and scary because you don't know what you're doing. And I also learned that back in the days, people used to put bricks in their trunks to make the car go lower. Interesting. So can we expect more video projects from you? Yeah. All right. Well, we look forward to your next project, Frankie. Thank you. Tijuana and opera? It's not the first combination that comes to mind. Yet young voices are soaring to the sounds of Schubert, Strauss, Puccini, and Rossini. They say the music is transforming them, and they, in turn, are helping to change the image of a border city. Life can be a daily struggle in Tijuana with its crowded hillsides and noisy streets. But amid all the chaos and congestion of this rapidly growing city, beauty pierces through on a summer afternoon inside the city's cultural center. Opera is about life on a large scale. Great loves and broken hearts, grand schemes and crushed hopes, unflinching dignity and unthinkable humiliation. Tijuana is a stage for all of these, light and dark, dreams and despair. So no art form is more fitting for this vast border city where families from across Mexico arrive in search of a new start. A graduate of the Manhattan School of Music in New York City, Tijuana-born Monica Abrego grew up in Colonia Libertad. When I was 18, I went to the conservatory and I met this wonderful teacher, Mary McKenzie. And she is the one who introduced me to this opera world. And the first one who actually uh, told me, I think you have the potential to be an opera singer. Javier Carrillo's family lives in fast growing Eastern Tijuana. Here, the traffic is loud and the air is dusty. Javier grew up listening to his father sing Mexican ballads. Before long, Javier too was picking up a guitar, playing for change in city buses. Then one day, a friend led him to the Baja California Orchestra's conservatory, and Javier became hooked. In a way, through music, I bring out what I have inside. Through art, through singing, I hope to show how man can get away from many difficult situations in life. Javier is one of a new generation of young singers whose names are not yet in lights. They are young men and women who dream their voices will carry far beyond the border. Antonio Gonzalez, director of the Angela Peralta Chorus in Mazatlan, spent several months in Tijuana last year rehearsing the chorus in Donizetti's Don Pasquale. Tijuana is full of talent, of young people who have great potential. But Gonzalez says that potential must be nurtured with discipline and support. They have yet to change the opera world, but they are having an effect on Tijuana. The city now has a cafe devoted to opera, which last year hosted its first street opera festival, drawing thousands of people to Colonia Libertad. And the Tijuana Opera celebrated its fifth season in 2004 with the production of Don Pasquale, as well as an adaptation of Rossini's Barber of Seville, where Javier drew laughs as Don Bartolo. Some of the best action took place backstage when director Jose Medina turned into a mother hen as he encouraged and worried over his young performers. The son of a Tijuana band leader, he is a seasoned tenor, now passing on his knowledge to this new generation. Tijuana is 
has a hunger for culture and education and, and music and art. Music was part of Monica Abrego's early upbringing. Like many here, she got her start at church. Hers was north of the border at Our Lady of Mount Carmel in San Isidro. Today, she remains in New York and is striving for a career as an opera singer. But she came home to Tijuana last summer to play the female lead in Don Pasquale. I'm very proud to be from Tijuana. Um, people ask me, what's going on in Tijuana, you know? And I said, well, it's not really, it's not really Mexico, it's not really the States, it's just, you know, it's, it's a border. There's also lots of good things happening here. And, and I like to say it in, through opera. Tijuana is getting ready for its second annual street opera festival this summer. On another nearby center stage, women young and old, picking out that special dress for that special day. Forget the mall, there's one place in National City where generations of girls from both sides of the border go. Jody Hammond visits this thriving business run by sisters who like to keep it all in La Familia. Mm -hmm. Even big girls get to play dress up at Casa de Novia, a South Bay landmark on the corner of 20th and Highland in National City. The four Hernandez sisters have been in business since 1973, catering to the tastes of customers from both sides of the border. I think they're loyal to us because of the service that we give them. Virginia Hernandez Guerrero is one of the reasons customers are so loyal to Casa de Novia, which means bride's house in Spanish. Las Hermanas Hernandez were born in Mexico but raised in San Diego. They sell formal dresses for first communions, girls' 15th birthday celebrations known in Latin America as quinceañeras, and of course, weddings. It's coming like to a family house, and it's a very special place that you, you could get beautiful dresses, beautiful things, beautiful flowers. Often these are items you wouldn't be able to find elsewhere in San Diego. This is a cord, it's a lasso, and it's two rosaries attached together and one rosary goes over the bride's head and the other one goes on the groom's. Special rosaries and Bibles are available too, as well as arras, 13 coins in a small box symbolizing the groom's commitment to provide for his wife. Josefina Hernandez is considered the boss since she started the business in 1972. She's most at home working with flowers. In uh, Mexican weddings, they use uh, more artificial flowers. And uh, here uh, we use, we make more uh, uh, fresh flowers. Josefina creates her floral designs in what was once the kitchen of this old mansion, built in 1881. She moved the business here from Chula Vista 18 years ago. Celia is the eldest sister. Though the dresses sold at Casa de Novia aren't made on the premises, Celia does alterations and can personalize any style. So if the dress is uh, strapless and they want sleeves, I can add a sleeve to the gown. And maybe that's why people like the way we work here. Casa de Novia customers are nothing if not loyal. Many of the women who bought their wedding dresses from the Hernandez sisters are now sending their daughters in to continue on the tradition. I got my dress here, my wedding dress. My daughter got her uh, quinceañeras dress. My niece got her uh, First Communion dress, and it's a very special, very precious place to be. Customers range from little girls preparing for their First Communion to this blushing bride being fitted for the dress she'll wear for her 50th wedding anniversary. At Casa de Novia, your family, which is why customers wouldn't think of going anywhere else. Now that my daughter's having her baby, a baby girl, she's, we're gonna buy her dress here, her red baptism dress. There are actually seven Hernandez sisters in all. The other three have jobs in different professions. If there's a big wedding or quinceanera to prepare for, they're always ready to help out. Well, his art can be seen all over San Diego from Logan Heights to La Mesa. Sandra Torres now with Mario Torero, rooted in the history of San Diego, bringing a message of hope and unity. He's as rustic as the van that carries the tools of his trade. Armed with a paintbrush, Mario Torero is ready to stir up controversy with art, again. So you have weapons of mass destruction, which is 
obviously a lie now. They didn't find it. And then you have weapons of mass construction, which is what we're working on. Mario, who is originally from Peru, has a passion that's contagious. For more than three decades, he spent countless hours painting on the pillars under the Coronado Bridge. These helpers were once strangers. Today, they pick up brushes wanting to be part of Torero's mission. Mario is one of the original muralists here at Chicano Park and a member of the Chicano Civil Rights Movement called El Movimiento. Come up here for those people who want to stay together. Together, he and dozens of community leaders and just plain old citizens fought for this land. We were here uh, when this part, when they fought for the park. It is the, it is truly, truly a piece of his San Diego history. Uh, I think anybody jump at a chance to, to participate, be involved and support it. The land was part of Barrio Logan, one of the largest and oldest Mexican-American communities on the West Coast. In the 50s, the area's zoning laws were changed from residential to industrial, bringing junkyards and pollution. The community had had enough. The final straw came in 1969 when the Coronado Bay Bridge was built, piercing the heart of the barrio and bringing the community to its feet. There was walkouts, the artists came out, students came out, the community came out, and we, we picketed the land and took it over and created Chicano Park. The park became a symbol of their victory. Artists documented the struggle on the empty pillars. The colorful murals now cover most of the cement pillars, each one telling a different story or a piece of history. We're going to leave behind is art and books, photography, documentation, that this movement, the revolution, really did happen. Torero believes the future of Chicano Park lies within today's generation. Today, we have seen the change. It's a, much, it's, it's, a, it's a very beautiful and peaceful place. The community is, uh, has been uplifted. For Mario Torero and his fellow artists, Chicano Park remains a work in progress. But this time, Torero and his followers have colorful, rich plans for the empty, dark, cold pillars they call their canvases. Mario plans to travel to Barcelona, Spain. He says he'll deliver a handful of earth from the park, along with a heart full of passion. Gracias for watching Stories de la Frontera. Until next time, hasta la próxima.